one thirty four Murph episode one one thirty four. Welcome holy back, cow. folks. Holy cow! Welcome back to Game of Crime. Speaking of holy cow, Murph is pulling a college student crap. He is at a nice event. Oof. He 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 finally messaged me at midnight last night. <laughs> I finally got back to the room and out partying. <laughs> Oh, man, just think if I was drinking, I probably wouldn't be on here this morning, huh? Well, I, I, uh, well, to your credit, man, I messaged you about 6.30 this morning, and you responded right away. So, hey, mm -hmm. congrats, you man. Know, it's, I haven't seen Midnight in a long, long time. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need to see it again for a while either. I'm, I'm good. Uh, yeah, it's, it takes a toll on the body. Well, hey, folks, welcome back. As you can see, we're having fun. Murph will tell you about that in a second. Hey, welcome back to Game of Crimes. Hey, just some quick housekeeping before we get started. Head on over to Apple and Spotify. Hit those five stars. It really means a lot. Uh, we get, And also, you can leave comments on Spotify. So hit those things up. Leave us some comments. Head on over to our website, GameofCrimesPodcast.com. You're going to want to do that. Um, for our, our guests we'll talk about coming up some very interesting pictures so that's going to be on there follow us on that thing at social media at game of crimes on twitter game of crimes podcast on facebook and the instagram but where you got to be patreon.com slash game of crimes that's patreon.com slash game of crimes we had some good stuff on and i'll tell you what i got a candidate story already for you can't make this shit up we had a couple folks send some stuff in but i mean <laughs> Well, and you can't. I mean, some of these stories, you know, we've got 911 coming up. We've got Case of the Month coming up. Narcometer Review. You finally, I think, and by the way, you may almost be out of the doghouse. We don't want to let people know too much, but a somebody that was hard to find that also had a series made about them on Netflix. Welcome to the Netflix Club. You you are very close to lining that person up. Very close. This is, uh, I got to tell you, man, I'm, I'm at the, uh, and I'm still here in Beaufort, South Carolina, head home this afternoon, been here since Thursday night. Um, there's an organization called Core Medical Group. Uh, Sid Gordon, you and I met him and first met him in, at Southern California Gang Conference last year in, in San Diego. Uh, Sid is brother-in-law with the actor John Bernthal. So we got to meet John last year. But anyway, Sid is paying it forward by sponsoring. This was his third annual Military Appreciation Weekend. Um, and Core Medical Group, it, you like I, I let them draw my blood yesterday. They do. They test your blood to see if there's any deficiency in your hormones, your testosterone, the minerals, the vitamins, everything in your blood system. So I'll find that out soon. But uh, Sid, he connected with Mel Chansey. Now, Mel... Uh, we hope to get mail on here. He's promising me the world. We'll see. I met his wife, so now I got her on our side. Uh, but he's promised as soon as this movie comes out, he'll be our he'll be the first podcast he gives after this movie comes out. And just look him up, Mel Chancy. This guy is a monster. Love him to death. I mean, this guy. Once you meet him, or you think you've known him his entire life. But, yeah, but man, if you had got, met him twenty years ago, he would have ripped your head off and crapped down your throat. Let me tell you, he is the reason that cops carry shotguns. This man is a monster. <laughs> I'm not and, kidding you. He's a big boy. We, and we got we had some prior guests that had history with Mel too. So uh, he was on one side of the law, and our friends were on the other side, like uh, the presser, you know, and Chris. Pete Forselli. Yeah. Oh man, we got and so he, who's here? Lou Velozzi's here with me from ATF. He was a guest on our show. Uh, Chris Bayless, the Chrisser, he's here. Chris is the one that built the case on Mel Chancy. And now these guys are like brothers. I'm not kidding. You were sitting around there, you sitting around having a good time together. We got uh, Jason Redmond's here with his wife Erica. He's a former guest here on uh, Game of Crimes. I just I got to tell you, I've been fangirling. We got Audi, uh, uh, Cody Alfred's here. We're going to get him on the show. This guy was a former Marine. Made E8 the quickest of anybody ever in the history of the Marine Corps. More confirmed sniper kills than anybody. Um, I've been hanging out with studs all freaking weekend. Uh, it's exciting. I can't wait to get home and get some sleep. Because <laughs> daddy don't stay up this much as I am here, you know. Anyway, I, I just honored Sid and Mel. Thank you so much for having me here, brothers. It's uh, This has been so exciting. And here's the best thing, everybody. I got Morgan some free T-shirts. Oh, geez. Yeah, I'm taking them down to the Tommy Bahama store and have them sewn into one of the other shirts. <laughs> and by the way, how did that have anything to do with Patreon.com? I don't know, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm just excited. This has been a, you know, here I am, an old man hanging out with all these young studs. I met 
several police officers have been shot in the line of duty who we have agreed to come on the show. Uh, this has been just a target rich environment weekend. That's I'm just having a freaking blast here. So we say all of that to say this, whatever you do, just go to patreon.com slash game of crimes. And we'll talk about <laughs> a lot more of this there as well. Hey, now before we get into the show, just uh, also make sure you also head on over to Facebook. Type in Game of Crimes fans, our favorite mafia queen, Sandy Salvato, rules with the iron fist with the velvet glove. This is where we do a lot of stuff. The inside baseball stuff occurs. And actually, quite frankly, we've gotten guests from this. We've gotten great stories from this. So you guys head on over and do that. But before we get started, remember, this is a show about crime. We talk about bad people doing bad things and bad people doing bad things to good people. We take the story seriously, but never, never, never do we take ourselves serious. And how do we know we're not taking ourselves seriously? Guess what? T- I know it's early for you, Murph. It's late. <laughs> but guess what time it is? It's time for Small Town Police, Police Slaughter. Slaughters. You got, we've got to go faster, Murph. We're going to have to remove this. <laughs> hey, now this comes to my buddy from Rick Zach. Now, this is not quite a small town, but this, this is a candidate for Stupid Criminal of the Week. So, all right. Two guys appeared down in Miami. Uh, it wouldn't have been a big deal except for one thing. Two guys, James Hanna and his co-defendant, Nelson Walker, walked into the Sun Life Stadium Dolphin store where they play and were seen by other customers stuffing their pants with dolphin jerseys and hats. Now, the pair walked out without paying for the merchandise. Uh, police caught up with them as they approached the parking lot, but it didn't in there because the day after the arrest, the pair appeared before the Miami-Dade circuit judge. Now, you've just been in the Miami Dolphin store. You've been stealing a bunch of dolphin stuff. Probably you should not show up wearing what, Murph? <laughs> Dolphins jersey. <laughs> Both of them wearing Dolphins jersey. <laughs> oh, <laughs> idiots. Goes, but the guy goes, no, Your Honor, this ain't one of them. No, ma'am. It shows that that I ain't took no jerseys. I ain't took no jerseys. <laughs> well, the problem is, okay, so but he had number 15 on his. Another guy had number, uh, looked like 45 or whatever. <laughs> But the one, or 54, the other guy had number 54. Um, But this guy, the first guy should have had the number 29. You know why he should have had the number 29 on his jersey, Murph? (laughs) That's how many times he's been arrested? That's the number of prior felony arrests. (laughs) Wow. Holy cow. How's this guy out of jail? Uh, I don't know. This this occurred a while back. But, you know, here's pro tip, folks. If If you're accused of stealing Miami Dolphins jerseys, would be a good idea not to wear them to court. You're not kidding. You're not kidding. <laughs> All right, Murph. This next one comes to us from Bedford, Pennsylvania, population 2,865. Salute. Salute. Hey, Murph. Remember yes. in the days when you were a real cop, you worked burglaries, or even what's the most amount of money you ever seized at one time, even with DEA? Biggest amount of money? $1.3 million in cash. Yeah, that ain't nothing. Uh-oh. That ain't nothing. If you're in Bedford, if you're in Bedford, guess what? Investigators say an unknown individual, he has not been caught yet. He broke into a house made off with several pieces of jewelry, silver dollars worth $20, and uh, about $30 in loose change. But the total loss was over $2 trillion. What? How's yeah. that happen? Well, because he stole 20 Zimbabwe $100 trillion bills. Real. These are real bills. <laughs> All right. <laughs> these bills were issued during a period of hyperinflation and are essentially worthless as currency. Instead, they're sold as a novelty for about $10 a piece. So, Murph, I got to tell you, I worked a case one time. Two trillion. Two trillion went missing. <laughs> You know, and you convert that over to U.S. currency, that's worth about four pennies. <laughs> if you're lucky. If you're lucky. <laughs> All right. Funny. Yeah, final final one, Murph. Hey, remember that time uh, when you uh, you were eating somewhere in a restaurant? You left your weapon there? Oh, it's well, I'm sad to say it's happened more than once. <laughs> <laughs> could be worse, Murph. You could be this guy from Washington. He went into a store called Ziggy's. Now he was out shopping. Left the store, came back, said, hey, here's my name. Here's my telephone number. Here's my address. I lost an item. Could you find it for me? Good news is they found it. What's the bad news? It was meth. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) jeez. What an idiot. He dropped the bag up by the counter. He called back in, gave him his name and number, asking about a lost item. (laughs) 
uh, made it very easy to arrest his ass because it's right there on the video surveillance. So rule number one, kids, don't do meth. Don't rule do number meth. two, when you do do meth and leave your baggie behind, rule number three, don't call in and say, hey, here's my name and number. Could you find my meth for me? Oh, man, I tell you what, these criminals, they just never cease to amaze you. <laughs> it's crazy. Ah, mm. All right. Well, hey, Murph, uh, you got to get to do the intro on this one. We had a great time with this guy. It was a little, as you're going to find out, a little awkward at first. Um, yeah. But you know uh, what? And this this came at the recommendation of Tracy Jacobs from the Game of Crimes fan page on Facebook. Yay. So Yay, Tracy, we, you know, we tell you we listen to our our our, uh, our folks here, our players, and we did. She recommended we talk to a guy named Bobby Henline. Now, I had seen pictures of Bobby before, but I didn't know who he was. I started investigating, though, and as you're about to find out, you might want to have a tissue close by because you're going to be laughing so hard. You're going to have tears. I, we had tears running down our cheeks. <laughs> this guy is hilarious. Especially when he does the constipated rap. <laughs> oh, oh, that was terrible. <laughs> But I mean, it's, it's, this guy has the most positive motivational attitude of just about anybody I've ever met in my life. Uh, like Morgan said, you got to go online and, and, and check out the photos of Bobby and you'll see exactly what we're talking about. This is a true American hero, a true American patriot. Uh, one of the things I want you to listen for in, the, in his interview today is when he identifies his lucky number because he found out what it was. And I'm not going to tell you, you got to listen to the yeah. show, but <laughs> you might be laughing after you hear it. Um, this has been, it was a fantastic interview, man. Well, and we, you know, so like we say, folks, I mean, we may basically do everything about crime, but every now and then there's a story that reaches out and said, Hey, we want to talk about this. Now it's kind of tied to crime. I mean, of course he's over, got four tours, uh, you know, uh, deployed during operation and during freedom. Um, and you know, they were going after bad people. He was 82nd airborne, uh, you know, death from above yeah. guys fall from the sky. And, uh, so there, so there's a tie into crime there, but this is one of those things to where it's kind of like, we've had folks on before that have been, uh, burned, for example, like Jason Redmond, you know, uh, mm-hmm. talk, you talked with him folks that, so it, this is, but again, he's, he's funny. You, it's, it's one of those things. It's an acquired taste. You just, you, you have to set aside what you think and just listen. To, he gives you permission to laugh. He gives you permission to he laugh does. at him. He does. You know what? And, and Bobby, if you're listening to this, thank you very much, brother. But um, you said pass along your condolences or your regards to Jason Redman. I did. And he passes his love right back to you, man. And if you want to know more about Bobby, go to Bobby Henline, H-E-N-L-I-N-E, BobbyHenlineComedy.com. You can find out where he's playing, what he's doing. He's been on Netflix. He's been on TV. But Murph, we won't find out anything about him until I ask you, are you ready to play the biggest, baddest, most dangerous, stay up till midnight, can't barely drag my ass out of bed (laughs) in the morning, game of crimes? Hey, everybody. I'm so excited to bring Bobby Henline on here. Morgan and I were just beyond ourselves. Bobby, thank you. So get in, sit down, shut up, and hold on, and be ready to laugh. Well, our players out there, you know, and you know, normally we talk about crime related things, but every time, every now and then we take, uh, we diverge just a little bit. Like when we had Kevin Holland on, you know, for example, uh, uh, Delta Force, dude, you know, good operator, uh, you know, and we've kind of diverged a little bit. Well, this is a little bit of divergence, but it's a story worth telling because first of all, as with anybody in law enforcement and with many of our guests, they've sacrificed for their country. In many ways, we've had many survivors of sh- officer-involved shootings, many officers who've lost their partners in the line of duty. Well, this is very similar. This is a story about a gentleman uh, who went through a pretty significant event, lost many of his buddies, but uh, he's here to tell the tale. He's lived through it. And I got to tell you, listen, watching a couple of your videos, dude. That is some hardcore stuff. Nobody tell you know, only you could get away with saying some of those jokes. So we want to welcome Bobby yep. Henline. Sir. Welcome, thank brother. you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Some of the people uh, really get uncomfortable. Uh, <laughs> you got you to ease them into laughing at some of that stuff and uh, hold, well, the, hold their hand for a little bit and let them know it's okay to laugh. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. We're going to get into it, but just even your off your site. So you got a site called uh, Bobby Henline Comedy, H E N L I N E, Bobby Henline Comedy.com. Your clip from um, the Huckabee Show, 
Yeah. Just when you, there were some people, they weren't sure what to do for like the first two minutes. Do we laugh at the burn wave? And guys, we're going to get into this and the hula wave, you know, do we laugh or what do we do? I think people are like, are we allowed to laugh at this? But you know what? I, I and having watched a couple of those myself, I think it's it's more out of respect for you, Bobby, that you know people don't want to do anything to offend you because right, they feel a little uncomfortable. Right, that and and the fact that your four compatriots, man, your brothers in arms, there, you know, they made the ultimate sacrifice. And I don't want to get too serious because I, I want us to have some fun here. Uh, I want to um, have some fun with this today, so not get too serious, but. Uh, I think that's it, you know, and, and once once it's kind of like you give them permission, then all the fun starts. That's when everything happens. Yeah, yeah I've learned over the years that I have to slowly, all right, we'll, we'll come out there with the burn wave and we'll try to see how they are, test them out. And then like, all right, some of you aren't, aren't there yet. So now we're going to walk you through this. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you know, it's almost as uncomfortable as me sitting next to Murph and him just falling asleep, you know, in the middle of the day. So. Oh, that's, that's, uh, but you know, the good thing is when you got Morgan on your side, if you ever run out of gas or have a flat tire, you got somebody there to help you out. Cause that trooper training really comes in, a, comes into play. Man. <laughs> <laughs> the number of DEA asses we saved, you know, when they ran out of gas in the middle of nowhere. Uh, yeah. Hey, Two, we want to give a, a shout out to Tracy Jacobs, who yep. recommended you, Bobby. She's one of oh, our listeners. Awesome. She's on our uh, Facebook Green Crimes fan page. So, Tracy, thank you very much for the thank recommendation. You, We're going to have some fun. Yeah. So, you got fans all around the world, brother. Dude, you yeah, do. It's, it's, it's kind of crazy when you're traveling. And, uh, you know, yesterday I was coming back from Montana on a long, all day. And I actually, I'll get recognized now and then, once in a while, not, not too often. It happens. But the day <laughs> that I'm exhausted, <laughs> three people you know, recognize me, want to talk to me. And, and I love that. I'm just worried that I sounded like a zombie talking to him yesterday. I'm like, uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, oh thank you. Um, <laughs> I just worried yeah. about what I sound like. And I'm totally out of it. You know, oh, thank you for having low standards. Okay. And I fall asleep again on the plane. <laughs> hey, well, as we do with everybody, thing of ours, close on Austria. Now, normally it's how did you get started? Well, we've had criminals on, but we won't ask you about how did you get started in your life of crime yet. But, uh, you know, this, the military. So uh, what led you into the military family, you know, prior history? Uh, you know, what led you into, first of all, joining the greatest organization in the world, the United States Army? For you Hoorah. Navy people out there, go Army, beat Navy. So, uh, right. Bobby, so what, what led branch? you into I'm like the only branch. The rest are twigs. <laughs> Well, hey, by the way, there, I love that. <laughs> hey, and by the way, too, this is true. If you look at the DOD manual, when they talk about the order of flags, it is in the DOD manual. The Army flag is always first by DOD regulations. Like it should be. Is that because, it's, is that because it starts with an A? No. Order of precedence. And the Army is first, best, and always. I can't imagine DOD being that deep, man. It's got to be the alphabet. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> and Space Force is last. I'll tell you, even the Coast Guard rakes above Space Force now. <laughs> Easy now. Easy. Easy. No, we love our, our, our Coasties, you know, Semper Paratus. So, hey, but no, but going, Bobby, going back to how'd you get started in this thing of ours? So kind of, you know, where'd you grow up at and what led you into this? Well, I grew up in California. I was a Navy brat. And uh, I never really thought about going to the military, but... In high school, I wasn't doing, I was a roller skating DJ. I had the mullet, the earring, the Def Leppard shirt. I was rocking out. The Mustang too <laughs> that looked like a souped up Pinto. <laughs> those suck. I don't know why Ford ever went to those things. <laughs> That's a poor man's Mustang. <laughs> it was an abomination. I, I had a Camaro and I just sold my 2000 Camaro. But yeah, but you know, no. Back, back in the day, my, one of my. Uh, a fellow roommates had a must Shelby fastback Mustang. Oh, I dated a girl that had, had the boss Mustang, man. It had a four speed, her shifter. Oh, sweet car. But back to your yeah. really pathetic Mustang <laughs> too. So. <Yes. laughs> so I knew I had to join the military so I get a better car. <laughs> oh, so you could become an E3 and pay 20% interest on a Ford F-150 right, yeah. or something, right? Yeah. Uh, Don't worry. We finance E1 and up. Uh-oh, you're in trouble now. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I went in because my uncle, you know, I wasn't doing the right thing. I was kind of heading the wrong direction. Um, I dropped out of high school, didn't know what I wanted to do. And my uncle was, he's five years older than me. And so he's more like a big brother. And he said, you know what? We should go in the army together. Let's go into a buddy system. So I said, all right, I need, I need to do something. And the funny thing is my mother would not let me play football 
because she's afraid I get hurt. But at 17, she signed me to go up to go in the army. <laughs> of course, I'm not going to get hurt there. <laughs> Hey, get, that boy, get that boy out of the house. <laughs> hey, but curiosity, quick question. Um, you said you dropped out of high school, but did you have to get a GED before you joined up, or wh- what was the path on that? Yeah, the path on that was to get the GED, um, but they knew Desert Storm was coming, and I did. Yeah. <laughs> no one else did at that point. But it was funny because uh, I went to go study for the GED. You know, they got took a two week course, so I didn't take it. And the recruiter called me back and said, you still want to come to the army? I'm like, yeah, I'm just trying to get my GD right now. He's like, don't worry about it. Come on in. And I went to basic training without it. And in basic training, they pulled a bunch of us out. This is 1989. And they pulled a bunch of us out to take the GD test. And, and during wow. basic training. Where'd you and go to I'm, basic at? Uh, Fort Leonard Wood. I did uh, basic Dude, NAIT at Fort Leonard Wood. Chuck Driver. I went to Fort it, Leonard Wood, June of 1979. Delta 3-3, three, three, brother. <laughs> Yes, Alpha 310 back then. I can remember what everything was back in 89, but when I came back in later, I don't remember all the details. <laughs> well, yeah, I, what, ha- what happened with your GED test? I don't know. I, there's no way I passed it. I was asleep. <laughs> C- <laughs> apparently, CCCCC works. <laughs> it's like taking the hearing test. Just keep pressing and hoping for the best, right? Right, yes. <laughs> That's the last thing I remember about it, and I got out, and I had an education. I'm like, woo. But you said you went so AIT is advanced inf- infantry training. So, but what was your MOS? Were you combat? Because that Leonard Wood was obviously, you know, mostly combat engineers. Yeah, it's advanced individual training, and so whatever your job is. So I was at 88 Mike truck driver. They told me I could fix a broken truck or drive a broken truck. I'm like, how do you drive a broken truck? <laughs> like a tow truck? I'm like, yeah, I'm like that sounds easy. I'll do that. <laughs> and so you did that and shipped off. And I turned 18 just after the, the, the truck driving uh, truck driving training. I and mean, after I finished AIT, I turned 18, went to Fort Hood, and first cab. They made me a fueler in artillery unit. And I turned 19 September 3rd. And October 10th, I shipped off for Desert Shield. And that's when they told wow. me that the life expectancy of a truck driver in wartime is 15 minutes. <laughs> Like I thought I'd tell you that you were there. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Holy cow. Well, man, that that was so um but you shipped out. So what was it like? Is that your first time um international travel, first time on a plane? Not first time on a plane, but definitely uh international travel, you know, flying around a couple of times when I was a kid and then I was a navy brat and then oh, again yeah. to basic and stuff like that. But the funny thing about going back to when I first went in is, you know, my, this is my uncle's idea to get in doing a buddy system together. He didn't pass the ASVAB, so I ended up going in by myself. <laughs> oh. Hey, well, since you came from a Navy family, did you catch any grief for going to the Army? Oh, yeah, of course I did. But uh, I don't want to be on those ships. I don't want Marines chasing <laughs> me around those quarters. You don't have a lot of room. <laughs> oh, shots fired, as they say. And we always, we always have a, a rule. You have to define acronyms. So do you remember what ASVAB was? I don't. <laughs> I don't think I ever asked and paid attention. Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery. So it's it's amazing how some shit sticks with you. It's kind of like, you got to take the ASVAB. And my first time I heard it was like, the as what? You know? Yeah. Who's ass? Yeah. Who's ass? Um, so, People were asking what funny. it is. I said, I don't know. It's the test you take and they tell you what job you're going to have. <laughs> Yay. So uh, but so when did you go through Fort Leonard Wood? Were you there during the winter or during the summer or spring? It was summer. That yeah, was the worst little, time. Was, That's when I, it was hot. June and July. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. I went in May, June, July. Yeah. Just four, four, four months because basic and AIT right there at Leonard Wood. Just walked down the street and stayed there. Yeah. God. Ugh. Yeah, man. Worst, worst eight weeks of my life. I mean, that was the humidity and everything. We had back in the day, we had the old OD green. So you'd go out in an OD green, you'd come back in an OD black because you <laughs> just sweat the shit out. <laughs> But anyway, but let's let's talk about you. So you deploy. What was it like landing there? When you landed there, I mean, things sometimes don't really get real until like it starts getting real. So when did it start getting real for you when you landed over there? Well, I think because uh, you know for Desert Shield it was so slow at first. In the beginning, it wasn't like you're going straight into the combat or anything. Uh, we got in there. I remember everybody talks about this from Desert Storm and stuff that you get off the plane 
they put you in a tent and you have to drink this giant bottle of water while you're in Saudi Arabia before they even put you on a bus. They're like, you got to hydrate and you drink a bunch of water and they put you on a bus and they took you over to the docks. And then I remember I've always been the, the shy pee pee guy. I get stage fright at the urinal. You know, I can't, I didn't grow up in the country. I'm not used to just go pulling out, going on a tree somewhere. <laughs> like Murph. Yeah, exactly. It, was, it works. It works. <laughs> I got the shy bladder. So everybody else is filling their water bottles back up on this bus and I'm trying to hold mine. I just remember by the time we got to where we were staying on the, on the piers there on the docks that I, my kidney was failing. I was bent over and we're like in formation. I'm like, come on. I couldn't wait for them to, to say fall out. And I just took off running bent over <laughs> towards the porta body. And uh, so that was my first <laughs> welcome to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> like, so where was the base at in Saudi Arabia? Uh, it was Bahrain. You know, they put all this on the um, the piers, waiting for the equipment to come in. So you stayed in these giant hangars, um, this bunch of cots, rows after rows, and just waiting about two weeks for our equipment came in. Then you get your equipment off the ships, and then you just pull out <laughs> the first night. It's just Desert Shield still. We're not doing anything yet. We go out to the desert in Saudi Arabia, but you don't know this. You're 19 years old. You're like, oh, my God. Now you got to sleep inside your truck in the middle of the desert. And I remember, like, what if he opens the door and tries to get me? What if someone tries to get me? So I'm sleeping on top of the truck. <laughs> got my weapon. <laughs> I got my knife by me. <laughs> we were in no danger at that point. Uh, but we had, right. were young kids going, it could happen anytime. We don't know. They invade everywhere. <laughs> uh, sounds reasonable to me. And initially, when you get there too, like when you're out in the sand, it's it's not the, it's not the enemy that's the problem. It's some little freaking critters and other cr- creepy crawly things, right? Oh yeah, you get to find all kinds of neat stuff, and and you get bored, you find a couple of scorpions, and you start met, betting money on scorpion fights and all kinds of cool <laughs> things. Uh, things mm-hmm. things you got to do to stay sane, you know, for a while. So, um, but kind of walk us through then that first deployment. Then, so how long were you over uh, there? First uh, deployment. What was that movie? they did about desert storm with the sniper it was it was pretty right on you uh got really good at volleyball uh, i was hand volleyball i was great getting pro out there <laughs> you know because during shield you're just sitting there you're you're waiting for to see what's going to happen and then when storm kicked off it was just go 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 and that was that's when it really really kind of hit right before shield or right before storm uh, we do a couple of raids now and then with artillery guys. We go in with the fuel trucks and artillery tanks and do some raids. And then it, then it just all of a sudden kicked off and it was 36 hours of just drive, 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 drive. And, uh, we had no C- TCs back then. You didn't have a passenger with you in our fuel trucks. Um, so we would drive all day with the tanks as we're pushing forward. And our unit went up through Saudi Arabia and, uh, into Iraq. We didn't even go through Kuwait. We went straight into Iraq to Basra is where we ended up at uh, right at the end of desert storm in a Republican guard camp is where we ended up when wow. we did the ceasefire. There was like no sleep until we got there. Well, wasn't it during, uh, did it happen not to, I'm trying to think now that you were saying that a, a story popped up about a, um, basically a, a, a group of supply trucks that made a wrong turn and they ended up being captured. Uh, I'm trying to think they had like four or five soldiers hurt or captured some, um, do you remember what I'm talking about? It, it made the news for a while. It was like a, a, a lady and, and some guys. I'm trying to think of the name. Um, yeah, um, you're, you're referring to 2003, the initial invasion in Iraq in 2003 yeah. um, is when, yeah. So that one, because I had the Desert Storm got out for 10 years. And then after 9-11, I came back okay, in. Okay, that was 2003. Got it. Okay. Yeah. All right. That yeah, was that a was different Jessica, war. Okay. What is Jessica's last name? That was the... The yeah, lady that got I remember seeing that on TV. Soldier that got right, captured. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, okay. I fast forwarded too far. Then that's a decade ahead. Let's let's go back ten years, <laughs> back to your time. <laughs> so, but 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 you know you they but they obviously put you through a lot of the training. You fired your weapon and stuff. But even even though you're driving a truck, were there times where uh, you were targeted that you guys you know we're talking well before the IED incident? But were there times where you came under hostile fire just even uh, driving your truck? Yeah, for, I didn't ever, in Desert Storm, I didn't have to ever fire my weapon. Um, we had some artillery shot at us a couple of times. They retaliated with some artillery. It um, wasn't very close. We were lucky we had to get you know get in the foxholes and get down just in case. But uh, luckily, they were bad aim. They had bad aim, so that was a good thing. So Desert Shield was pretty mellow for me. You had a couple little scares here and there, but 
nothing, you know, like like today's you know Iraqi freedom stuff is a lot different. It was over quickly. Yeah, well, it was too because uh, I remember, you know. Where, where I Murph will laugh when I was a trooper, but uh, after the end of uh, Desert Storm, Schwarzkopf, you know, decided to take a little time off. He actually came up to our airs, big news, because pheasant hunting, he went pheasant hunting. And one of the best places is out in southwest Kansas, a place called Scott County. So all the news was with Twitter because Schwarzkopf came out, you know, after uh, Desert Storm was over and right, I think right before he retired or right after he retired. But yeah, it was, it, it was, uh, the, the shock and awe, you know, I remember the yeah. announcement being made, I think, trying to think where I was, but, you know, you hear uh, the announcement, Ken, you know, the invasion or the liberation of uh, Kuwait has begun, you know, it's what they said. And right. shock and awe, baby. Yeah, it was quick. And by the time we were camping in the Republican Guards right on top of them in the ceasefire, we woke up in the morning, they just are all coming out. We we're just collecting them, bringing them to the prison camp, stuff like that, just processing them through. Yeah, you just and so yeah, that's right. You think about the difference even a decade makes in terms of warfare, you know, versus you know, uh, uh, Desert Storm versus uh, OIF, you know, uh, uh, or Enduring Freedom uh, OEF. Um, yeah, just the difference in warfare. But like with you, so how long were you actually deployed then before you before they pulled you back? How long before you rotated back to the states? So I did uh, six months out there for Shield and Storm. So I was out there for six months there and all that, and came back. So what'd you do after you came back? Because, uh, you know, you just don't go, it's just not like all of a sudden, hey, I'm driving a truck. Uh, now I want to go airborne. So how did you, how did this whole thing uh, of falling from the sky happen? Well, I couldn't go airborne the first time I went in because my mom was signing me up. And so I had an uncle, all my family was Navy. I had one uncle go Army. And he actually, his parachute tangled up and he drowned at Fort Bragg when he was Ooh. 18 years old. So oh, my man. mom, when I said I want to jump out of plane, she said no. So I made a deal with her: if you quit smoking, I won't go airborne. So that was her deal. She fi she finally quit smoking last year. <laughs> <laughs> well, she said she'd quit. She just didn't tell you when. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, it was like, you know, I got out after that for ten years. You know, in '92, I was out. I did my three year term that I signed up for, and I was out for ten years before uh, and then nine eleven happened. So what'd you do before 9-11? What, what were you doing after you got out of the Army? Uh, any job I could find. <laughs> I was lost. I should have stayed in. Um, no, I was doing, I worked on the railroad. I drove trucks since that was my experience. The warehouse and trucks was my main job. Living in California, having a family, you had to work two or three jobs. I mean, at one point I had four jobs. I'd go work on the railroad, do track repair between San Jose and San Francisco. And then at night, I go to the Jewish Community Center and do some maintenance. On the weekends, I helped the Fleetwood Mac Tribute Band as a roadie. I'd help them set up and shut down and overnights at the radio station, just whatever I could do to feed the family there. <laughs> yeah. Where, uh, when, when you were in California, where were you living at? In Santa Clara, California. Oh, yeah. Like the, yeah. Yeah. New Levi Stadium. Yeah, that's that, – that's, uh, and uh, just get off a little tangent here – that was how it was when we grew up. I'm I'm a little bit older than than both of you guys, but you did what you a had lot to older. do to feed your family. I'm mean, a little bit, right. a little bit. But you know, like working four jobs, and I started as a city cop in the '70s. That was I, I had three other jobs as well. Any job you could get. Yeah, you did that. You don't see that a lot these days. <laughs> what you only have one job. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that must be nice. <laughs> yeah. I tell people I only work half days anymore, either the first 12 hours or the last 12 hours. <laughs> That's about the uh, truth. So during this time that you're driving, like you said, you felt lost. Did you think about getting back in before 9-11 or did, you, did that just kind of escape by and you thought, hey, my time in the Army's over? No, I've always talked about going back in, but I got married when I got out, had kids and uh, I went back in the National Guard for a little bit, the California National Guard and you know, I, I did that. Uh, what do you say? You can't spell wimp without the MP. I, I did it. I was, a, <laughs> I was an MP for a little bit um, for the California National Guard. So I did that for a little bit. Uh, again, we didn't do much. We we sat around on the weekends and watched football. <laughs> That's our training. <laughs> but uh, but then I, I always I missed it. I missed it. But my, my wife at the time didn't want to be married to anybody in uniform. She didn't care. Law enforcement, military. She didn't want that lifestyle. Um, so. I stayed away from it, and then when 9-11 happened, I was actually talking to a recruiter right before. We had moved from California to Washington State, and 9-11 happens, and I was already talking to a recruiter because I was kind of looking away into my options. I was I was looking about going back in the military, uh, smoke jumping, 
go into firefighting, which apparently I end up doing anyways, <laughs> or going <laughs> or going crabbing. You know, if you're in Washington State, you go out crabbing and stuff and making money that way. And I met a guy. Uh, I was working at a furniture store, and one of the guys working there, he was out crabbing, and one of those cages crashed into his face. So he had to have, have his face reconstructed. And I'm like, okay, I'm not going to do crabbing. But again, I, my destiny was my destiny, I guess, no matter what. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I was talking to a recruiter, and he's like, okay, it's going to take a lot of time to get you back in. Um, you know, I got all his background checks for the last 10 years and all this stuff. So I said, okay. I'm going to talk to the wife. She said, yeah, you should do it, because she thought they wouldn't take me. She thought I was too old. I was 30 years old at this point. And then, boom, 9-11 happens, and all of a sudden, recruiters calling me. Hey, uh, you still want to come in? I said, I definitely need to go in now. You know, this, I can't let this just happen. This is a sign that I need to go back in. And I was back in October 31st, the next month. Wow. Back in basic training. uh, And that's what Patriots do. Yeah. Yeah. We had a lot of Desert Storm veterans uh, overflowing the barracks and back, going back to basic. You know, it's funny you mentioned that because when I went through in 79, you see some guys show up that are already E3s and they got their combat infantry badge. And I'm looking at yeah. them. They were, in, they were in during Vietnam and then they got out and they came back in, you know, a few years later and they went back through basic training. I remember one of the guys right now, Charlie Branch, it's like you're sitting there kind of in awe of these guys because here they are. They're recruits like us. I'm just, you know, 19 year old little fucking, you know, <laughs> sophomore out of college, you know, going through dur- during summer. And here's guys with already the CIB and they're already an E3 coming in. It's like, you know, just half my drill sergeants too came out of Vietnam. So these guys had seen it, you know, they'd been in the shit. Yeah. That's when I came back in, so there was that, that blank time. So my drill sergeants were young E sixes. I had to come back in as an E two. Uh, I got to an E four before I got out, but I had to come back in as E two and start over. But once you have, um, all that time in service, I just needed six months time in grade before I kept going up. Of course, until I got to, you know, become sergeant, staff sergeant, then you got to get the points and systems, all that. But um, it was none of the drill sergeants had been to combat. But all these guys come back in. Now they got five guys. There's five of us prior service in one platoon. So the drill sergeant's like, all right, you're the platoon leader. You guys are the squad leaders. You guys show them how to make the bunks. You guys show them how to do this. Uh, and they wouldn't let you wear your combat patch in basic training. Oh, oh, really? So I hung it in my locker. So every time they come to do an inspection, they just start asking about the patch, and they would even check my my stuff. <laughs> then they go out to the next one. <laughs> Distraction. <laughs> yeah, but but I also think it's respect to these guys. Knows like that drill sergeant, whoever it was, was smart because he realized, hey, I can make my, I can make your life, I can make my life easy or hard. And the way I make my life easy is by putting people with leadership who've been there already in charge of stuff, you know, and, and training yeah. the new guys. So. Yep. That's a guy. That's a sign of a good NCO too. Uh, you know, non-commissioned officer, somebody who realizes, hey, you got to leverage. You know, figure out what you're good at, figure out where you need some help at, and find the people to help you do it. So, um, so when you get, how long did it, so you went through basic again? How long was basic at that time? Was that still like eight weeks? Right, it's still eight weeks. It's funny that you know when you get there the first day and they come yelling, you go get off the cattle trucks and they're screaming at everybody. Uh, they come to me, are you prior service? Yes, drill sergeant. All right, we'll be back. And then they go get everybody else. <laughs> and, and then they finally got two or three of them come around me and they go, this guy looks like like, like Richard Gere from Officer and Gentleman. So they made me get down and do flutter kicks and say, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently wow. with the shaved head, you know, before all this beautiful disabling good looks I got, apparently I look like uh, Richard Gere. <laughs> Well, I, I saw a couple of pictures of you in uniform, you know, with, with the bray on, you know, the desert, you know, the desert tan camo. And uh, you kind of do look like that. But f- fortunately, they didn't ask you, where are you from? <laughs> Good thing right. you didn't say Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> oh, even worse, I got to say California. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that, that makes yeah, the we'll answer easy. About, we'll probably talk about that later in the interview here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, I was I mean, joking around are, that before, I used to look like a mix between Vin Diesel and Spock. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what? I got a friend that says, you know, when you hear things like that, he says, hey, it's your story. You tell it the way you want. Right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way I remember it. <laughs> so, um, but when you get out, so like you say, you went back in in October or so, like, you know, December, you know, January. So what, uh, what do you go into? Do you keep the same MOS? Do you change MOS? You know, what do you go? Where do you go from there? 
Yeah, so you know, going back in, I was all who are ready to go, and I told the recruiter, "I'm doing infantry, airborne, ranger. I'm going to do all this stuff." And he says, "No, you're not." Like, what do you mean? How bad is my <laughs> score? I can't go infantry. <laughs> my, my score was so bad. I, I can't. but what, what what I found out is they needed truck drivers. They needed them, so that were they needed uh, truck drivers in the army. So they're like, "You got to come back in when you're same OS." They knew they had me. They didn't have to dangle a carrot in front of me. I was coming in no matter what. So they didn't even give me airborne. But during AIT, or during basic, they came around and go, who wants to go airborne? I'm like, me. I've tried to sign up for it. But I realize the recruiter, he he holds on to that when he needs to give that bonus to somebody else to lure them in. So, uh, But I ended up going airborne after basic training. They, they ended up giving it to me in there in my contract. So that's how I eventually got to go airborne. So you go right out of AIT then into airborne? Right, right. And one of the funny things, when I got to AIT, so basic training, I'd go back with everybody. When I got to AIT, I show up to check in, and the drill sergeant's looking at me, and she's like, look at my uniform. <laughs> she's like, are you supposed to be here? They told me where I'm supposed to go. <laughs> she goes, let me check. I think you might go in the prior service barracks. <laughs> There's the people that are reclassing and stuff like that to different MOSs. So luckily, I, I got to do that. So I got to go stay in these NCO barracks, and I just had to show up for class, and I was free to do whatever I want, go bowling or go out town, have a couple of drinks, whatever. I was free. <laughs> I wasn't restricted like everybody else. So that was kind of nice. nice. But it, I found out one of the drill sergeants, two of the drill sergeants, one graduated truck driving school before me and one graduated truck driving school after me back in 89. <laughs> Wow. N- nice. <laughs> <laughs> when you went through basic, where'd you go back through basic? Same place or a different place? This time they sent me to Benning for basic, but then I had to go back, of course, go back to Fort Leonard Wood to do truck driving. And then for airborne, you come back to Benning, right? Yep. Go back to Benning again. <laughs> so, hey, so tell us about going through airborne. So now, I mean, like I said, you, you've done the truck driving, you're done with that, but now you get to go airborne. What's it like showing up that first day, you know, and you're going, I finally get to do this. Yeah, I'm excited. I want to do this. I was 17. Now I'm 30 years old, and I finally get to do it. <laughs> and it's, it's oh my god! So it's, you're you're pumped at that point. You're in the, 30 years old. Makes I don't know how would I react it when I was 17. <laughs> you know, but at 30, you're mentally you're in a different place. So I was I was excited, back in shape again, feeling good after all that training and basic and stuff. And I was ready to go. You know, it's two weeks of learning how to fall <laughs> correctly, <laughs> and then one week jumping out of an airplane. Right. What are they? It's one thousand two hundred and eighty feet. You guys were doing static line originally. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You do about twelve hundred feet static line, and once you get to like eighty seconds stuff, you'll be jumping out at seven or eight hundred feet. So you're only in the air for a minute. <laughs> you got to make quick decisions. And that decisions. shoot better work, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> We've had a couple of oops in there. That first time you stepped off the airplane, any hesitation? No, but, you know, they're, they're slapping you. Know, you've seen the videos. If you haven't done it, you've seen the videos. And there's go, go, go. And as I turn towards the door, the drill starts like, go. And I remember bouncing off the doorway, the wall. just going, <laughs> falling out like that. A big silver mark on the side of my arm. Uh, but it was awesome. It was a great feeling. There was a, a sergeant major that was going through with us. Um, so learned his rank. Yeah, they you supposed to everybody's airborne supposed to be all equal, but you know certain ranks teams are not going to be equal no matter what. <laughs> so I remember looking at Sergeant Major. I said, "All right, three more or four more, and we're going to get airborne wings are going to pop out of our ass. It's going to be awesome." <laughs> <laughs> what did he say? He just kind of looked at you like rookie. <laughs> <laughs> These young idiots. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but, but, you, but you know what? Most most of the – you look at the branches, even like law enforcement, a lot of young people in them, right? You want that excitement, that enthusiasm. But yeah. even having it at 30 years old, having that excitement and enthusiasm, I just can't imagine it would be like, that'd be great. We had a couple guys I was with because I went from there into ROTC, but we had guys that went through Air Assault and through Airborne. And just listen to those guys talk about just – it was a difference. It was the look in their eyes. It was just that they get a different look on their face. And it's like, God, it was fucking awesome, man. You know, you go. <laughs> so excited. And of course I had to call my mom. Like a little, you know, back then still working with pay phones. <laughs> uh, I go and call my mom from the pay phone each day after each jump. Like, I'm okay. I made it. <laughs> so a big mama's boy. Smart, smart man. For those folks who haven't done airborne, kind of tell us a little bit about. So, when you're jumping that low, do you have a reserve shoot, or is it just like your primary shoot, or how does that work? Well, you, you got the reserve, and uh, 
when you have to run, if part of the training with the reserve is you want to ha always have that rip cord covered so it doesn't accidentally go off in the plane. Because if that goes <laughs> off in the plane and that starts getting sucked out the door, everybody in front of you now has to jump no matter where you're at. You'd be over a street at that point. Everybody has to get out the plane. So they, they stretch out covering the, the, the reserve. And so we were doing training out of a tower. You know, they do that. I think I just want to say it's 32 feet. Something like that. It's, it's just two feet over what the average person gets. It's a 34-foot tower. And so I think 32 is the average height that the most people get afraid of heights. So they go two two more feet. So doing that, you go down a zip line like a type thing. You jump out and with just the harness on, you fly down a zip line. And when you go running back up to do it again, you're supposed to cover that rip cord. And so I'm running, and I wasn't. I was just so excited. I just did that rappel thing. And I'm running back, and the sergeant airborne yells at me, rip core grip awareness, get down, beat your boots. I didn't know what beat your boots was. And I was like, um, um, I got down on my back, started doing fluttering kicks. I thought that's beating my boots. <laughs> but apparently beating your boots is you touch your knees, touch your boots, touch your knees, touch your hips, touch your knees, hit your boots. You go up and down like doing squats, slapping the side of your legs. But I didn't know that, and I couldn't figure out what to do. So he goes, you're too stupid to smoke airborne. Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> really, I should have been a Marine. I would have done great. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> well, then I can say Simper Fry now. Simper <laughs> Fry. Oh, my God. Oh, oh, oh. oh. All right. We're laughing because you're laughing. That's the only reason, Cal. So. That's right. That's but, right. But I learned a new term of art when I went through basic. They said, we, we somebody screwed up, whatever. They said, it's time to watch TV. And I'm going, okay, damn, Skippy. No, watching TV was. You put your back up against the wall, and then you scoot down until your back yeah. is against the wall, and your legs are at a ninety degree angle to the you ground. Hold that, yeah. you, put your, you put your hands on your knees, and you sit there, and then they tell you. And it's like you think I can hold this for a little bit, but after a couple of minutes, you're going, "Oh my god, this is going to hurt." Oh. Yeah, also, you're trembling. You look like Michael J. Fox. Oh, too soon. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> you are our guest. You are clearly you to lock and load and fire at will. So. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, so, um, so how many jumps? So you go through two weeks. So you you do your final jump. What's the what's the ceremony? The process for getting your wings. So in the in the old days. Um, and we still we we got we got to be a part of your blood wings, <laughs> where they oh. punch your wings into your chest. Um, I, I hear they don't do that anymore. And even then, we do blood rank. Each time you got your rank, someone come down and pop you in the, your rank on your collar there and get your little blood because you got blood wings, blood rank. And every time you got you had to run down and get it sewn on real quick afterwards, so they couldn't keep <laughs> punching that metal in you. <laughs> <laughs> at, lunchtime, if, at lunchtime, you know, if you got ranked that day, uh, you had to run down at lunch and get that sewn on to uniform real quick. Because if you kept that metal on there, people would be come by all day long. Congratulations, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. So, yeah, but you're just like, yeah. You, you love it. You're just excited because it's, it's five jumps. You get it. Uh, you know, that the, they call some of those officers that just go to airborne school but they don't go to airborne unit five jump chumps <laughs> yeah well you're not that's real what airborne so you can spell the word airborne with with as many jumps as you have <laughs> that's what we also learned from some of our prior guests that went through ranger there's one thing to go through ranger training you know but there's another thing to get the tab and another thing to get the scrolls so i mean everything's kind of like you know even right. airborne it's like you might go back but making combat jumps that's you know that's where that's, it starts getting uh, that's what our crazy guys uh, get really excited we um we threw out our food in iraq in 2003 <laughs> we were upset because we were you know it was with 80 second we're out there and we're getting ready to jump in the initial push in iraq we're supposed to jump into baghdad 24 hours we're putting parachutes on vehicles and all kinds of stuff just getting ready to, to go into baghdad and then uh, they pull us back because apparently the walls were higher. There was some intel that wasn't right. The walls were higher. The, the intel of how many troops they had was wrong. You had this, the storms coming in, the big sandstorms. So we didn't get to jump in. But then we're watching the news having lunch, and then we see that 173rd jumps in up north. 
and they get their combat jumps and we don't. Oh, we were pissed. We couldn't eat our food. We just, oh, this is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> you want to go to the Super Bowl. You want to play. You, you want to be in the game. You want to be on the bench. Oh, so you had your Travis Kelsey moment at that time, yeah, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to say it wasn't that bad. <laughs> yeah, you don't normally get up into a ranking, you know, a senior NCO or a Luke officer's face and start screaming at him the way Kelsey did to Andy <laughs> Reid, you know. Listen, Swarf Cop, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, that what, might be a career move right there. What was that, private? <laughs> What's the rank below private? Uh, oh, second lieutenant. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> called in, in Leavenworth. You do something like that, it's called an inmate. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Speaking of that, here, here's a test for you. Who's the most dangerous man in the Army? Uh, spouses. <laughs> well, oh, well, that's one side of it, yeah. Second lieutenant with the map and compass. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, they say, what's the perfect like circle? The perfect circle is a lieutenant with a map and a private saying, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of the other most dangerous situations is the first lieutenant going, sir, I have an idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's about as a redneck saying, hold my beer. <laughs> well, Murph's used to that. You know shit about that when somebody says, hold my beer. No, you, you don't You don't ever give up your beer. You go to work with it. <laughs> That's right. Never give up the beer. <laughs> so um, so let's kind of now start getting into uh, – so that, that was your second – that was your second tour, right? So the first one was in uh, Storm. The, the second one was uh, 2000, 2003. 2003. Yeah. So how long were you over there before you rotated back? Yeah, we did 12 months and did a year over there. And, uh, and to go back, we said earlier, that was Jessica Lynch in that convoy that where Jessica she came Lynch, in. Jessica Lynch, yeah. The real, yeah. yeah. Squirrel in my head was working. <laughs> but yeah, we did 12 months. We uh, went into Baghdad, uh, had Fun. We battled all the way along. The Battle of Samoa. So my job then as a truck driver, uh, the IEDs weren't huge then yet. So we had infantry guys in the back of our trucks with any second. We just go up clearing towns all the way up into Baghdad until we got there. Then we built a base, um, the Fob Falcon in Baghdad, Southern Baghdad, is where we ended up settling up for that year and just going through Baghdad trying to clear stuff up. When you rotated back, um, what what did you do during the time that you rotated back? Was it always like preparing for the next row? Did you know you were going to ro- go back over again? How, I mean, do you volunteer? Do they assign you? How does that work? Oh yeah, I mean, you got you got Iraq and Afghanistan going on, so you're going to go to one or the other, you know. So we, and when you're not, you're you're going to school, uh, or you might be moving. Like I came back, I had to go to school to get uh, my E five to become a sergeant, so I went to school for that. Uh, helped get everybody else that was going somewhere and then turn around. I actually tried out for special forces that year and hurt my back. So after this, I was like, I'm going to get in shape. <laughs> and then I went to Fort Carson. So I was home 10 months, but during those 10 months I had did the schooling, the, the trying out for special forces, all that stuff. And then moving the family to Colorado and I get to Colorado where they're three months and I got to deploy again for 13 months. So when my dad went to oh. Vietnam, it was out of Fort Carson. We were living in Canyon City at the time. Yeah. And that's where he deployed Carson, out of. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's where I oh. went to, to Carson with 3rd ACR. Uh, had a great time there. It was funny. The uh, It was weird because you come from an airborne unit and you're hua, hua, hua. And you get to 3rd ACR and their thing was Aia. They would say Aia. <laughs> I'm like, this is weird. Why do you guys say Aia? It's a, it's Indian war cry or something they picked up from the history. And so oh, I made wow. fun of it that, you know, Hua is the cellmate on top. Aia is the cellmate taking it. Aia. <laughs> <laughs> I bet that went over big up. Well, yeah. that could also that could also double as a navy joke, hot swapping bunks. Um. Yes. Oh, oh, but oh. after serving with their ACR, I gotta say those guys had it together. We had a great tour. You know, I gave them crap, but um, it was one of one of one of the best tours with those guys. They were they were awesome. We ended up uh, going to Tel Afar, Iraq, for twelve months, and I stayed an extra month, you know, just moving equipment back and stuff. But that I mean, we went to Tel Afar, we liberated it. It was the same. Thing is like Fallujah. We put berms up all around it. Uh, took displaced civilians and put them on our camp, and 
and just went in there and got there's a lot of IED schools in there coming over from Syria and stuff. So it was up by the Syria border. Wow. So we we cleared out that whole town. They did such a good job, or we did such a great job. The um, the mayor of uh, Telefarf came back to Colorado to welcome us home and thank us for what we did for his city. It was pretty cool. Wow. Very nice. <laughs> there was a time I was uh, part of a thing called Operation Restored Warrior. They'd bring guys out to uh, McCoy, Colorado, um, <clears throat> on the other side of the mountains there. And they have a camp, and they, you know, it was about helping them get back to normalization, normal lives. But it was really cool because we're sitting there, and we're seeing a couple Chinooks go up there into the mountains. Well, it was the 10th mountain. Uh, they were guys were training for a high desert, you know, or high, high, uh, high altitude warfare, you know, right. in snow and stuff. Yeah. And I was just, it was awesome just to see those. I mean, we were quite a distance away, but you could hear those Chinooks and see the, um, just enough with binoculars. You could see, you know, people deploying out of the Chinooks and then, you know, right? it's like they're at the top of a mountain, man, into the snow. I'm going, you know, God bless <laughs> these people who do oh, that yeah. stuff, man. Yeah, that's, 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 it's crazy that the, the new cold weather training, Alaska goes to, um, what is that in New York? That's where 10th Mountain is. Can't think of it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, uh, the, Fort the, Drum, the, right? The, Fort Drum. Yeah, Fort Drum. Yeah, the, 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 they've got a special name for that school for the winters, you know, the yeah. training, cold weather training school and stuff. All these names change all the time. Well, you rotate back, so let's get into your fourth one because this is where, you know, obviously shit hits the fan. This is where your yeah. uh, big story starts. So when you go over the fourth time, uh, now this, I mean, it's your third time in um, uh, right. after 9 11. Correct for Operation Iraqi Freedom, yep. So when you go back over, what's your mentality? What are you thinking? Are you, I mean, I, I, you hate to say familiarity breeds contempt, but are you kind of like, yeah, I've been here, you know, done it, you know, saw, yeah. saw the movie, bought the t shirt? You know, the the crazy part it's kind of changed each year. You know the rules of engagement, different things have changed. Um, this time, I felt different about going over, and I even uh, I did things different before I left. I felt something was going to happen to me. I didn't think I was coming home. I, I told my family like I made sure there were savings in a bank. You know, I was, I was E six at this time. I just got my E six staff sergeant. And I just told my wife, I said, you know, it's my fourth time total going over there. I, you know, when you gamble, you know, eventually. Yeah, you can only roll the dice so many times, right? And I, I just felt something weird. I hadn't seen a, a, a son of mine. I had, uh, I hadn't seen him since he was four years old. His mom and I, I moved around so much and we were young. And so I hadn't seen him forever. And it turns out I found him and he was living in, in uh, Alabama at the time, just about seven or eight hours from where I was at Fort Bragg. So I talked to his mom and said, I'd like to see Nick. You know, I just, I'm not trying to put a guilt trip, but I feel something's different about this deployment. And he was turning 13 and seen him since he was four. So I go and I drive all night, sleep, sleep in a bowling alley parking lot, hang out on the 13th birthday with my son. We have a great time. That was March 4th, 2007. I deployed a couple weeks later and April 7th, is when I was hit. Hey players, that is the end of part one. Part two comes out, as always, on Tuesday. In the meantime, go check us out at Game of Crimes on Twitter, at Game of Crimes Podcast on Facebook and the Instagram. Also, go check out our website, GameofCrimesPodcast.com. We've got a lot more information there, including our book list. Any book written by our guests will be listed there. In the meantime, go check us out also, patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. It's where we put a lot more content you won't hear on our regular podcast. We go into a lot more topics, and folks, it is a lot of fun. So go check us out, patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. In the meantime, everybody stay safe. We'll see you tomorrow for part two. 